Hi, I'm Daniel with Plumpy Thimble, and today we're going to be taking a look at RAR. That's stupid. Roar and Ride is a game for 1 to 100 players. It resides squarely within the Animal Kingdoms universe, a richly colorful line of games that feature, you guessed it, animals. In this offering, players take a score sheet and a personal agenda card. This agenda card is unique to the player as a way to score points separate from the shared dice rolls to come. The game is played over five rounds, each round consisting of three rolls. All six dice are rolled, and players fill in as many or as few numbers from that roll onto their score sheet in the corresponding age row. The goal here is to try to appease one of this council member cards that are available for all players. Each of these council members gives points based on certain criteria. Over the course of three rolls, you choose when to stop scoring for that age. The sooner you do so, the higher bonus you get. You also get at least one number each roll, should you choose, to assign to your kingdom. The kingdom section will give you end of game points that you can work towards the whole game. You can choose to forego writing numbers in your age row and instead place them in the kingdom. The game ends after five ages, after which you score all your points, including those earned from your personal agenda and from the kingdom section. The player with the most points wins. So these, these roll and rights are getting pretty popular, huh? I mean, we've come a long way since Yahtzee where you were just rolling dice and writing numbers in, even though that's essentially kind of what roar and write is, but boy, have they hit their stride in the last few years. But roar and write sits squarely in into one of my favorite subcategories of the roll and write genre, and that is ones that play almost exactly the same by yourself as it does with any number of players. Now, the box claims that you can play from one to 100 players, um, and I'm, I'm not 100% certain how accurate that is, due mainly to the fact that there is a finite number of those personal goal cards. If you remove that aspect of the game, absolutely, you could play with any number of players, the people that have score sheets. Now, that being said, I do really appreciate that they've included that aspect of the game where there is a separate way that you can earn points away from everybody else, the shared roles, the shared potential for scoring points. And the reason I appreciate that is because with a game like this, there's potential for there to be optimal moves that you can make. And by including hidden agenda roles and hidden opportunities to score more points, it doesn't quite negate that fact that, th that maybe there's the most optimal move you can make every single role but it certainly plants the seed of doubt into other players' minds and into your own minds, and you have to, it becomes a, even more cerebral in trying to figure out for you what is the most optimal move. And you can see someone making a move that maybe isn't that same move, but it, it might make sense for them. And suddenly the most optimal move becomes maybe not the most optimal, or maybe even more optimal. It's, I, I don't know, I really appreciate the fact that there is different ways to score aside from any other any of the other players in the game. Then again, that whole thing with the optimal move, I mean, it's that's difficult because there are so many opportunities, so many different things that you can do in this game. Um, dice allocation is something that I absolutely love. Uh, and roll and write is essentially just, what's the word? Uh, it's, it's simplified down dice allocation. Instead of using dice as workers or, you know, using it to take actions, you straight up roll the dice and assign them where to go. I really like dice allocation. And so this, you roll the dice and you choose. First, you have to choose which of the council members you are going to try to appease in any given round. You try to figure out where in your kingdom you might place dice. You figure out, you weigh the options between uh, Xing out potential spaces for, for the offerings that you're gonna give to maybe fill out your kingdom board more. You've gotta weigh the balance between your personal goal. Um, and it, I'm making it sound very complicated uh, in terms of having to figure out where you wanna place everything. And the best part is that's not the case. You have lots of options, which means you have lots of opportunities to come back to, uh, you might make a move that is less than ideal, possibly. I mean, especially the, the aspect of this game that really draws me in is the push your luck aspect. You've got a number of different possibilities that you could go for, different goals each round that you could try to achieve. Halfway through the round, you could realize, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna meet that, that requirement. There are ways that you can fall back on other, maybe less luke, point lucrative options for you, but there's always something that you can fall back on. Whether that be fulfilling your personal goal or, or patting it up and, or going for a different council member or, or scrapping everything and putting dice into your kingdom. There's lots of opportunities, lots of choices for you to make here, and none of them are overwhelming. And any mistake you make is not going to necessarily be completely detrimental to your entire game. Now, one argument against this game might be that it uses dice instead of cards. Uh, one of the more recent trends that we've seen, especially in the last few years, is instead of using dice like you might see in Yahtzee or Farkle or some of those old traditional games, games like Welcome 2 and Kokoro Avenue of the Kodama are 
fantastic games in the genre and they've done away with the dice almost entirely. And instead of dice, they have cards. And the reason cards are so appealing to this genre of game is because you can mitigate the types of options that players have. Instead of it being left up completely and literally to the roll of a die, you instead can say, okay, there's really only so many times this option can be taken. And you can tailor and specify exactly how your game might play out and you can mitigate some of the some of the negative options that you might get. Roar and Ride embraces the type of play where every player has a similar ground and it, it emphasizes the play style that I love where it is do the best you can with what you're given. And so it balances between being a, a very cerebral, very thinky game and being Yahtzee. And that balance is exactly what I want to see in a game that I can play within 15 minutes. And again, I, I need to emphasize that this is nothing like now it's not nothing like Yahtzee. It is. It's got Yahtzee elements to it, right? You're assigning, you're rolling dice and assigning them. But there's so much more to it. There is a, a lot more, but it has that base core mechanic that people are familiar with, that are instinctive and intuitive, and it just makes sense. On top of that, oh, good grief, the game looks good. I haven't played the other Animal Kingdom game, but if it, but my understanding is the artwork is all the same, and it is phenomenal. Who did the art for this? Illustrations by Katie Grierson. Well, Katie Grierson did a fantastic job. So look, getting down to it, maybe it doesn't scratch the same strategic itch that a game like Kokoro Avenue of the Kodama or Welcome To or On Tour might, might scratch. But it satisfies something different and something that I really, really enjoy without going completely outside of the genre. So what Roar and Ride occupies for me in my mind space is it is the perfect game to introduce someone to the roll and write genre that has maybe only seen and you know participated with a game like Yahtzee or Farkle, uh, simpler dice games. It's also a game that's ideal for someone that already knows that they enjoy roll and write games, especially if they play them solo, because this has that hallmark feature of, again, being just as good solo as it is with any number of players. And I will emphasize that, yes, it's a light game, but I also need to emphasize the fact that this is not any less enjoyable than any of the other games that I've mentioned. Roar and Write is good. It is more than solid. It looks fantastic. It's nice and portable. And unlike those Roll and Writes that, that do use cards and, and have different mechanics that you might not be intuitively familiar with, it's one that you can understand almost instinctively once you understand how the score sheet works. Roll and Write is joining that increasing number of games that I'm disappointed that I have to give up to send off to another reviewer, um, but I'm excited to see what the finished version looks like. And this, I mean, this prototype that they've sent me is, um, I should emphasize that, it, it is a prototype and a lot of the things um, might not be indicative of what the final version has. Uh, that being said, it's a really high quality prototype. Um, so I'm excited to see what the Kickstarter has to offer. So that's it. Carla Cop has knocked it out of the park with Roar and Write, a game that I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy um, and highly recommend that you check out. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. We've got more coming out. Uh, we are, again, working our way towards a thousand subscribers. And thank you so much to all of you that have subscribed so far. All right. We will see you next time.